Okay, so um, I'm going to share with you uh, three short stories. Uh, they're personal stories, and what I would like you to think of while I'm uh, sharing them with you is uh, to see what was the source of the challenge I was facing. Okay, so as I was growing up uh, in school and at home, uh, I was a very timid girl. When my parents would go to school to ask uh, what the progress had been, uh, my teachers would always say, oh, she's an excellent student, great marks, no problem. It's just that she's very, very shy and she doesn't really uh, want to talk in class. And um, we're wondering whether there's something wrong there. She's very sensitive. So as I was growing older, I started to um, collect all these labels on me, shy, timid, sensitive, oversensitive often. And when I was 21, I was uh, still studying uh, in Athens University, the uh, Econ uh, Athens um, Economics University. And uh, I was also working for a company, uh, a group, uh, a drinks and food uh, company, quite a big one in Greece. And uh, I was called to go and present at a sales conference uh, up north my, my marketing plan. Uh, I was an assistant brand manager with uh, um, some uh, brands which were not as important as uh, the brands that other people had in the department, in the marketing department. But still, uh, I had been given a budget, a marketing budget, and I had to present what the plan was going to be. Uh, so uh, we all went up as a team, as a marketing team. And um, I entered this big conference room. Uh, with all the buzzing salespeople talking very energetically. And then uh, the conference started. So up goes the senior brand manager, um, almost my age, a little bit older actually. And uh, he just uh, was so confident on the stage. He, he was using his PowerPoint. He was going up and down, no need for a podium, no need for notes. He was brilliant. I was so envious of him. I was looking, wow, admi in admiration, yes, not envy. And then the next one went up. She was brilliant too. And the next one and the next one. And last, it was my turn. So I was already gasping for air. I thought I had uh, practiced all night, the previous night. I thought that was what you were supposed to do because I hadn't um, been taught how to present before. So this was my first time presenting and to an audience of 200 people. So my legs just went like jelly. I don't know if it's ever happened to you. Uh, I almost tripped uh, on the wires on the stage. I put my things in front of the podium. I looked down at the audience and there was a huge blank. It was just absolutely black because of course all the lights were on the stage so I couldn't see anybody at the bottom. So then I started uh, because I had rehearsed especially the first part of my speech that that went okay and then suddenly um, I had blurred vision I couldn't see what my notes were saying and my, my uh, mind just blacked out completely. Um, there was a murmur in the audience. I could hear them saying things. It was th those seconds. It, it was for a second, I think, that it happened. They told me later. But for me, it was like 10 minutes of my life, uh, just wanting to be uh, disappeared, just wanting to go somewhere under the carpet, nowhere to be seen in shame. So that was uh, one story that I want to share with you. And then the other story uh, is about my first managerial post. So uh, later I went to Britain to study and uh, get an MBA. And uh, I, my first uh, job was non-managerial, but my second job, uh, when I was 26 years old, I was given 
uh, to manage a team of seven people. So we were in a very small uh, space, office area. Uh, I was in the middle and everybody was around. It was an open plan uh, office. And I just uh, took out my MBA books and uh, tried to remember how do you set uh, targets? How do you motivate people? How do you communicate? You know, all, all from these books that I had read because I had never done it before. And I had no idea, not a clue. So, you know, the MBA courses normally show you that uh, you have to be very clear with your targets and then you motivate people to achieve targets. So I thought, okay, that's what I'll do. So one of the ladies, Jane, uh, she was older than me, actually. And she was a mother of two children, two very young children. So she would often come in in the morning late. And uh, some days she would call in and say that her little boy was uh, ill and that she couldn't, she, she couldn't come to the, to the office. In those days, uh, teleworking was not uh, all that popular. So that was out of the question. So I was getting really anxious uh, because uh, her work was falling behind. Other people had to cover up with, for her work or I had to cover up for her work. And I just uh, was getting very frustrated and I obviously showed my frustration. Uh, next, we had John who was uh, much younger than me, uh, just finished uh, university and uh, he had no idea how to work or uh, he didn't also have a work ethic in the sense of what I had read in the MBA uh, textbooks. So I was furious with him too. And I showed my, my fury. And then uh, I had another uh, five people around me. Uh, some didn't know what to do. So they were waiting for me to tell them what the next thing was. Uh, others were uh, going ahead, forward and overproducing or without asking me, uh, making uh, serious mistakes because they would uh, go to a different department and ask for something that wasn't supposed to be asked or whatever. So it was a real, real mess. And uh, I say that uh, it is due to my um, lack of management, mainly because I'm not gonna blame myself completely, <laughs> but mainly because of my uh, ill management, these, seven people either asked to be transferred to a different department or actually left the company completely and went on to different jobs. So I lost my first team, team of seven. So what do you think was missing? What was going on? What was the source in these uh, stories they told you? The first one maybe? Does somebody want to try? Um, maybe you didn't have, have experience in that uh, in that area. Nobody taught uh, taught you how to how to pres how to do a presentation, for example. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Ex inexperience, lack of experience. I would say practice. Yes, the same as experience. Philippa, thank you. Who else wants to try? The clue is the labels. I, I put, I attached many labels to myself. Confidence. Thank you. I'm, I'm reading connection. Yes, connection, confidence. So confidence is linked to beliefs that we have, which are limiting. They stop us and we usually um, get, get them when we are young and we very rarely release them because we don't even understand the effect they have on our being. So confidence, lack of connection. I would courage. Say, courage. Well, I don't know. I think I, 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 think I had courage <laughs> um, because I, I went for it. I really tried, 
I remember trying. Um, although courage could also be connected to confidence. So it's not uh, completely uh, out of uh, the mark. I mean, uh, courage to speak because uh, the professors were saying that you were shy, you don't uh, speak yes. a lot. Yes, yes, indeed. You're right. Okay, and uh, Samatakis Andres is saying uh, experience. Okay, brilliant. So, what about the the next story, the one where I was managing a team? What was happening there? Um, I think that you shouldn't have uh, expressed your ang your anger first, <laughs> and uh, maybe you should uh, have tried to uh, be in their shoes. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, if it's the Excellent. correct expression. Yes, so. yes. In well, I would like to, to say this expression that Lucille just mentions. I think it's called empathy. We will see in a minute what it's actually called, because um, empathy is a misunderstood word, I think. That's my view. But we will see this in a minute. So why is it important to develop emotional intelligence? The why for me is important to talk about the purpose, uh, especially when we're about to learn something, we need to know the overall context where that sits. Okay, so what is the purpose of doing this? Um, so right now, the way I see things is that 80% of our planet is actually living in fear in a state of uh, flight or fight, uh, much like in, in a survival mode, you know, trying to survive the, the situation. The thing is, and that this is my view, that the situation, the circumstance is uh, not just COVID-19. That is the tip of the iceberg. What is really happening is a, a technological revolution. In fact, it has been happening 10 years now, but it has been accelerated by uh, COVID because we've had to, uh, most of us start working online. So this has been uh, accelerated and um, the, the rate of increase is going to take us into a, a very, very quickly into a very different age, an age of uh, artificial intelligence, 5G, and uh, you know better, because I have a lot of students here tonight, so uh, the students know, uh, can feel the future more than uh, I can, probably. So for the page of humanity to turn in a non-violent way, so that for us to flow into the next stage of our evolution as humanity, and this is the big picture I'm talking about, uh, it is my belief that uh, we need to uh, switch modes and transcend, transcend the situation. So uh, try and uh, flow into from survival mode to thriving mode. And the only way we can actually thrive is if we do this together. So it's, uh, we all thrive together. And uh, in my view, it's about, it's about trying to um, thrive in such a way that we start focusing on becoming active leaders, self-leaders. So global active citizens in a sense. And I don't, by global, I don't mean, uh, covering the geographic location of the whole planet, but I mean, uh, looking to see how we can cooperate uh, with each other, even in our microcosm, instead of just taking care of our family and our loved ones and our work colleagues. So it's more about looking from inside out rather than from outside in, because up until now, I feel most of us are looking from outside in. Uh, so really being introvert rather than extrovert, but extrovert in the sense of uh, being in your center first, yeah? Because if you're just extrovert, then you're missing the point, you're missing your center. So the starting point, and we will see this with uh, emotional intelligence, uh, developing the skills of emotional intelligence, for me is 
the question, who am I? Okay, who am I? Who, who truly am I? Know thyself, uh, Socrates used to say, and it's such a simple phrase, but it's, uh, so difficult to comprehend and, and start working on that. So this is the big picture, okay? So now I will go down, I will chunk it down to the small picture. So first of all, uh, we have the uh, research that shows, and we are also know, uh, intrinsically know, that happy employees equals effective employees. So in the workplace, uh, we know that job satisfaction is an important factor for uh, a long-term sustainable company, sustainability. And also the second uh, situation that we are facing at the moment down here in the uh, smaller picture here on Earth is that uh, problems have started to become uh, much more complex. And actually that's quite fortunate for us humans because as uh, Derry Hannam, an uh, uh, education reformist in Britain uh, has said, and many other people, especially in the business uh, area, in order for us to be able to thrive as human beings in the workplace, we need to have skills that machines cannot have. So we need to be different from machines, and that is to do with the skill sets that we have in order to be able to uh, resolve complex problems. So for example, uh, a machine, at least right now, this moment in time, I, I will not make a forecast of the future because I don't know what will happen in the future. Uh, at least now, even through artificial intelligence, it's not possible to resolve uh, a conflict. Of course, uh, online mediation is uh, very much uh, being developed at the moment. So uh, some forms of uh, conflicts, which are to do with purchases, for example, online purchases, can be even now resolved online automatically from uh, uh, special software programs. But conflicts, for example, uh, between a uh, household, like a divorce or a child uh, care, uh, cannot yet be resolved. You, you need human intervention. You need skillful people, especially people who are skilled in soft skills. So that is a positive side of the chunking down picture. So what I'd like to share with you now is a quick uh, video of uh, one, uh, in my opinion, a very inspirational uh, leader, business leader. Uh, he's not anymore on earth, <laughs> but he was my mentor and uh, you will see why. Yes, we can. Thank you. Welcome to CNN World Report, where we bring you uncensored stories from around the world. I'm Guillermo Arduino in Atlanta. Coming up, online search engine company Google allows its employees to bring dogs to work. And elevators are replaced by slides at the offices of the Red Bull Energy Drink Company in London. As ERT explains, a business increase is taking friendly work environments to an entirely new level. This is not your average Greek company. This is Piscine Del, and it has won Greece's Best Place to Work Award for the past two years. 115 lucky employees work for the company, or as its CEO, Stelios Stavridis, refers to them, 115 leaders. We want each one of us to be a leader and an entrepreneur. We want people to feel free to express their opinion. We want them to be very creative. We want them to continuously learn, and we want them to learn how to adapt to change. Piscine Ideal is no stranger to awards. This year alone, it won the I Am A Person Award, a prestigious distinction for the way a company treats its employees. Most companies require that you wear a tie to work. However, in this company, bringing your bathing suit is mandatory. Look at what I mean. 
Alex, what is it exactly you're doing here? I'm testing the wireless network to make sure it's fully operational in all facilities of the company, even here by the swimming pool. The company that sells swimming pools as well as spas allows its employees to indulge in luxuries like this while working. It's about promote, promoting creativity and helping maintain your work and life balance. Company policy also favors leaner and healthier employees. That means a 2% pay rise for those who manage to lose 12% of their total body weight. The same goes for those who quit smoking. Benefits like these have people from all corners of the globe applying for jobs at the company. Take Milan Weiss, who left a life in France for a job here. It's a great team. We all are really united. We're a huge family. Uh, everybody has the same opportunities to excel. Alexandros worked in New York for several years before returning to Greece. We all feel that we're part of a large family. Uh, our company's slogan is one team, one dream. And we all work together to get the job done. One team, one dream. At the end of the day, human relations is what makes this company the best place to work. Will Vasilopoulos, ERT, for CNN World Report. I wish my bosses would let me work from the swimming pool. In the end, we are also like a large family as well. Well, that's all for today's show. One team, one dream. Happy satisfied employees, a huge productivity, and all of them leaders. So a few facts on emotional intelligence, why emotional intelligence? 90% of top performance have high emotional intelligence levels. Um, according to Dr. Travis Bradbury, who's uh, one of the leading experts on emotional intelligence, 58% of uh, our job performance uh, is responsible. And I would say, I would argue more than that uh, for our emotional intelligence level and uh, salaries can be quite high when we are uh, more emotionally intelligent because uh, we can climb the hierarchy if that is what we want to do in a company. So these are some of the benefits. I will allow you to just glance quickly through them because uh, all this is available online. There's plenty of stuff online. I just want to go on to discuss exactly how we develop emotional intelligence uh, traits. So what I was saying before, it's important to start moving from the I, I survive, to the we. Uh, we thrive all together and then back to the I to transmute it from I survive to I thrive. So emotional intelligence has to do mainly with the top part which has to do with self-awareness and self-knowledge. Then when we have this in our base, it's the bedrock, we are able to be more successful in managing our emotions and more successful in reading the environment and the people around us. And then of course, more successful in handling our relationships in a resonant way. So in the words of uh, one of uh, my teachers, Greg Braddon, we are entering the age of meeting ourselves again. So it's going back in, back into the center in order to come out in a, in a different way. So this is what I was saying before. Uh, I thrive and create, becoming a self-leader. So the motivation from within. And then we can all be leaders. And this is my belief that uh, there's no copping out. We can all be leaders from our own seats, from whatever it is that we are doing. And this is the purpose, this is the value of developing emotional intelligence. So the way I have uh, studied emotional intelligence and I have developed it over the years is seeing it as an inclusive part of being a compassionate leader. So I have called this uh, leadership model uh, heart-led model, leading from the heart. 
And it has three components of which you can see that emotional intelligence is one. It also has the self-leadership skills, which are slightly different and complementary to emotional intelligence skills. And the leadership style has to do with compassion. Thank you.